right, hello everyone, and welcome to Edit Talk. Edit Talk is a bi-weekly virtual talk show created out of the need for a global learning community focused on topics in education that directly impact Caribbean nations, diaspora nationals working across the globe, and uh, everyone else far and few between. Edit Talk features teachers, principals, administrators business leaders and dignitaries who share their expertise on critical topics facing education today with the common goal of moving education forward and our students upward. My name is Dr. Duane Dice. I'm your host and the co-founder of Education Solutions International Inc. Please visit educationsolutionsinternational.org to learn more about uh, how ESI supports students, educators, and uh, school communities. And please subscribe to, uh, to receive ESI's uh, updates. Today, I am joined with my co-host, Dr. Miguel Barker. And in a little while, he's going to share with you what's going on. Um, just a word because of the feature in Women's History Month, and later on in the show, we're going to feature Sarah J. Garnett. And she, back in the days, was the first female, or is, is the first um, black female principal in the public school in New York City. So we're going to feature her um, later on in the program. However, we have with us our special guest, and we welcome her, Dr. Charmaine Gooden Monty, to EduTalk. And uh, just a short note on Dr. Monty. Dr. Um, Charmaine Goodemonte. She has over 30 years experience in education, communication and training and has ser um, served on different levels of the education system in Jamaica. She's a transformational leader and a success advocate. Dr. Goodemonte is an educational consultant and a communication and a public relations consultant. He, she's also a school inspector. She is an author of three books. I'm gonna highlight two of them. One, which one of my favorites is the inclusion of students with special needs in the regular classroom. And the other one is winning PR and communication strategies. Um, Dr. Barker, it's so good to see you. And in a little while, we're gonna to talk to Dr. Goodmonty. Um, it's so good to see you, Dr. Barker. Wagwan. <laughs> I'm always good to see you, man. As yes. I know, it's quite late in the night here, but um, I'm up and ready to go. Yes. Always good to see you, and great to see the guests as well. Very much so. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, Dr. Charmaine Gooden uh, Montif, uh, welcome to Edu Talk. We Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Geis and Dr. Barker. Yes, we're excited to have you. Um, so, that we can keep get the ball rolling here with you. Um, you you have quite a lot of years in education. Uh, before we get over to your the first book that we're going to talk about here and everything else that you have been doing, um, just give us a, a more you, you know wider perspective of who the person uh, Dr. Charmin Goodmontif is. Like where you're from, um, the, the influences you have as a child growing up and so on. Tell us a little bit more about you apart from what we share here. Thank you so much, Dr. Dice. I am Charmaine Imancia Gooden Monteith. And to start with my name, my, I was named by my aunt, Aunt Elise, and you'll hear more about her later on. She said she went to somewhere where they had a competition and Charmaine came first and Imancia came second. I will not <laughs> say what, what I'll conclude from that, but I am happy and I love my name. I'm usually I'm teased about my middle name, but I really love my name. Yes. Even when I was getting married, I remembered when I was when they said Charmaine Gooden, I asked them to insert my middle name. Well, I hail from the beautiful parish of St. Anne, the Garden Parish, from a very small district that still has not yet made it on the map. I searched and I still haven't found it. <laughs> it's wow. a district called Glasgow District in, the, in Southwest St. Anne. It's a small district between St. Dacre and retirement. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're heading to a town, it's a farming community. 
Yeah. And I would not want to, to, I really wouldn't want to come from anywhere else beside Glasgow. I'm proud of where I'm from. Yeah, and one of, my, one of the things that delights me a lot is when I remember when I went to high school and persons figured that I came from which, like which high school? or Brownstone or so on. Which high school? Because, you know, you don't really sound like you come from Bush. Yeah. But I'm happy about my humble beginning. Yeah. And I'm really happy to be from the um, Glasgow district. Which, which high school did you go to? I went to the best high school in Jamaica, and I won't say one of the best. And it must be St. Hilda's Diocese and High School oh. for Girls. Okay. And <laughs> okay. the journey to St. Hilda's was really one of triumph in the end because yeah. I sat my common entrance exam like everybody else. I was one of those star students at Bethany Primary School mm -hmm. under the, my beloved principal then, the late C.E. Walton, Christopher Walton. Oh. And he had high hopes for good, according to him. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine when I walked for two miles from Glasgow to St. Oh. David to buy the cleaner? Yes. And I couldn't find my name. I looked under schools in St. Mary, schools in every that's other where, That's where Dr. Barker is from in St. Mary. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I really wondered whether or not my name was misplaced. But, you know, just fast forward, um, yeah. there was a, a lady in my district. She was a teacher and she became a principal, Mrs. Avi Sawyers. Mm -hmm. She told me about the common entrance exam, the, about the 5% the entrance exam that they had at St. Hilda's because her daughter was a sixth form student there. And I sat that entrance exam. It was much more difficult mm -hmm. than the common entrance exam. And thank God I got a second chance. And that is why I believe in second chances, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had a point to prove. So I went to St. Hilda's and I hit the ground running. When I was in 1P, I came first in four subjects. I don't remember all of them now. It's a long time ago, but I remember I came first in Spanish, first in science, first in math that I could hardly do. And I don't remember the fourth subject. And I came first overall in 1P and I said, good, I deserve to be at St. Hilda's. You can imagine how I felt having failed my common yeah. entrance exam. So, so well, hold on. Um, Tell us a little bit about the support that you had around you well, as you as you were you know dealing with this this kind of challenge you know i mean obviously you're coming from a humble background you know as i say a farming community mm -hmm. you had the the challenge of or the you know had the, the problem of failing common entrance which has its stigma attached to it mm -hmm. and then now you get a second chance but tell us a little bit about the people around you and how they supported you through that time that's a very interesting question. My parents believed in me. So it wasn't the typical parent who would kind of, you know, really put you down when you, you failed because all along I was succeeding. In fact, my father had a shop and he promised me a trophy and my mother promised me anything at all that I wanted if I had passed. So I had a good um, support system at home because my grandmother, she, she was the um, midwife in the community. Oh, okay. Midwife. Midwife, and yeah. Friend. Mm -hmm. But she was all she had her basic school. Mm -hmm. So from the early age of three years old, I was able to read the gleaner. And wow. so I knew from then that I wanted to be a teacher from very young because of the influences at home. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of books around me. I had a supportive mother and father. I had an, I was living in an extended family because mm -hmm. my my mother, she well, I had two grandmothers, not 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 I didn't know my father's mother, but my mother grew up with grandma Rosa who had the basic school and I had my other grandmother who was my maternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. I really had a lot of support and my auntie today, she, she's the one who goes around with me and I'm speaking and boasts about me. Mm -hmm. But boy, she was strict. I tell you, I did get some beaten sometimes, but I, tell you, <laughs> but I really got the good support from, from home. And yeah. so we grew, we grew up um, knowing that the only way out of Glasgow was through education and it, it, it didn't it didn't escape us because all of us who grew up in that home and in my other grandmother's home we have done well locally and internationally and thank god for that mm -hmm. so you saint hilda's tell me just remind me where is saint hilda's located well saint hilda's diocese and high school for girls immediately as you hit the center of brownstone saint anne okay. and you there's a beautiful building on your left you can see it it's, it's um, ancient architectural design. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. It's similar to the Hampton School in St. Elizabeth in terms of the architectural design. Yeah, I mean, okay, okay. But mm -hmm. it's a school, it's an all-girls school. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I really missed anything going to an all-girls school. 
because after that I went to an all girls college and but after that oh. I was saying perhaps I should have really got a chance to experience what a I poet is school yeah. like. but, yeah. but, that, but I experienced that at primary school but St. Hilda's is a school boy the days when I went there trust me That's I true. learned at school but I have to speak the truth <laughs> there was a little prejudice mm -hmm. um, because you know that was a school for high flyers and they yeah rich people so coming from the hills a few of us I was a day girl I was not a boarder mm -hmm. uh, I remembered my principal at the time I had two principals Miss Lynch Muriel Lynch and Deaconess Winnie Bollet and I was asked when I was in 1P to read no my friends who invited me back to deliver the keynote address at our 40th um, anniversary I'm having left high school they could not believe that it's the same because I was very shy I wow. wouldn't talk in class I used to just perform on the tests but I never liked to talk and I remembered my principal asking me to read and dear God I was so fearful and I got up and when I was reading I didn't clear my throat and Lord she, she shouted at me and she was said girl what kind of reading is that will you clear your throat and read and I jokingly said to my friends when I addressed them at our anniversary, 40th anniversary, I said to them, you know, boy, life is something else. Just look at me now because I remember I was so fearful and here am I, I have overcome. I've been teaching public speaking. So yeah, right. I, I teach public speaking for school leaders. Mm -hmm. So God has been good to me because I have overcome my fears and the things that I wasn't good at, I have really learned now how to overcome and to, to do even better at them. So, you know, but- I was gonna yeah, I was going to ask you about to influence you in education, but it seemed like the, the question that Dr. Barker asked you, you really got the support from your family. Because yes. in education, that I didn't even know that your grandmother, one of them, had this, the, the um, early childhood uh, institution. That, that's yes, pretty it was remarkable. Called Grandma Rosa's basic school. Yeah, um, that passed over to you. Yes. Um, so let's we, you talk about, you want to share something else? Yes, I was. I didn't quite finish, but you can tell me. Just give me the cue, and I'll move yeah, right yeah. on. No, carry on, man. It's your carry show. On. All right. So after I left, so I went to Saint Hilda's, mm -hmm. and when I left Saint Hilda's, I, um, having grown up with my grandma, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. So, you know, those I grew up in the seventies, and I'm happy that I grew up in the seventies. I left Saint Hilda's in 1978, mm -hmm. and so I went and did the youth service. So mm -hmm. those were the days when Michael Manley, Manley was in power. So I had on my, you know, khaki suit, to the military looking khaki suit and so on. And I was trained and I worked at Blake Preparatory School for a year as a youth service worker. Where is Blake? Blake Prep School was in Kingston at um, Glenmere Road. Oh, okay. Because my mother used to live in Kingston. So after I left high school, I went to live with her in East Kingston at, on Outlook Avenue. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and not too far from the Windward Road Post Office. And, I, and the Blake Preparatory was in Franklin Town, um, Kingston 16. So I started the year, I went to Shortwood at the age of 19 years old, and I became a teacher. So when I went to, after I left Shortwood, I, my first job was at Brownstone Secondary. Well, first and only job was at Brownstone Secondary School. And after that, I went to uni the University of the West Indies. I went during Gilbert year. Mm -hmm. And when I was, the, I got, uh, shortly after I got to Kingston, um, Gilbert came, Hurricane Gilbert. Yeah. I was stuck in Kingston for two weeks, can't go back home. Remember, we didn't have a lot of phones and so on then. So I had to wait that out and then I sat, I was going to, to UWE to do Spanish. Mm -hmm. Then I heard about um, mass communication. I didn't know what it meant, mm -hmm. but it sounded nice. <laughs> and I saw it as if I wanted to do it. So I ended up doing the entrance test. They only wanted 30 persons. And I sat the entrance exam and I got in. And so I, I did mass communication at UWE at Carrimac. And then after I left UWE, my first job was at the Jamaica Teachers Association, where I worked as their public relations officer for 14 years. Because of that, my former boss, Dr. Adolf Cameron, he, between um, the JTA and the Caribbean Feder Teachers Federation, Canadian Teachers Federation, I was sent on a fellowship to Atlantic Canada. So I went to Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I was assigned to the public relations departments in all the provinces. So I honed my skills there and came back home to Jamaica. Then after that, I did a master of science in human resource management. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, 
In 2017, I graduated from the Nova Southeastern University, where I did a doctoral program, a doctorate in education um, with a major in special education. I've done numerous short courses, for example, the Caribbean Broadcasting Union and the Caribbean Union of Teachers, because one of my the, the functions that I had at the JTA was to host a radio program. Mm -hmm. I only had the experience at UWE where my friends used to ask me to read for them, to ask me to read for them. But I've never really, done, I hadn't done a program before. So when I came, I started working at JTA the Monday and they told me that I had to go on air this, sir, by, by the following Sunday. So I had to record the program. It was very frightening. I remember that first program, how timid I sounded, but <laughs> <laughs> that's behind me. And since then I, I hosted the program and, and then I left the JTA and joined the Ministry of Education, where I work as a training officer, education officer for the senior executive group and for the general management group, which included education officers. Yes. And then I wanted to come to Mandible to join my family. Mm -hmm. And I worked at I came to work at the Ministry of Education in Region 5, the yes. home of champions. Yeah. <laughs> the home of champions. Where I worked as a community <laughs> relations education officer. And I did some brief, uh, brief supervision of two schools while I served in Mandeville. Yeah. Then after that, I a position at the JTA came back up again that I had always wanted, um, the head of professional services, mm -hmm. assistant secretary general professional services. And I was selected and I returned to the JTA in 2012. And five years after sitting in that position, I applied for the position of deputy secretary general and I was successful after a very competitive um, you know, interview. Just one, two things I'd like to mention. When I was in professional services, the, the JTA signed a memorandum of understanding with the um, American Federation of Teachers to host a workshop on human trafficking. And I was responsible for that program. When they came and also heard an, an, about another program that they were doing that we collaborated with, they invited me to present at their TEACH conference in Washington, DC. They had mm -hmm. over 3,000 participants. Mm -hmm. I went and presented. And then after I did that presentation, they were very impressed with me. They wrote to my boss and asked him if I could join them um, to go to Trinidad and Tobago and to Barbados. And I went and I presented. So I love to present professional mm -hmm. development, keynote speaking, corporate training. Those are my biggies. And I love when I finish presenting or talking or mentoring or coaching and the person says to me, boy, I'm not the same. That's what I really love to do. That's my passion. Go, go ahead, Dr. Barker. Yeah, um, I, I, your story is an inspiring one, mm -hmm. but you, you tell it in a very linear way. So I'm going to go back a little <laughs> bit of mine, yeah? Yes, because yes. there are some aspects of your story that interest me and which certainly interest our, um, the viewers. our, our listeners. So, yes, yes. you know, country girl, Glasgow, yeah? Get her a second chance at St. Hilda's and is beginning to show that a second chance doesn't mean that you have to come second. Right? It just means that this is a second opportunity and you have taken it. Mm -hmm. And with that experience, and based on how you lay out your life at the moment, you know, the question I'd like to ask is first of all, there was a moment where you went to Shortwood Teachers College. And one of my questions would be it's a two part question in some ways. One of them is, how did you, I mean, if you're doing well, what made you decide to become a teacher? I know you said when you were younger, you said you wanted to do it, but as we grow older, more things come. But then that jump from even teacher's college to university is the one that interests me the most. What, what motivated you to make that move so quickly? Okay. You know, what were the things mm -hmm. happening in your life at the time that says, you know, I'm going to go to university? Good. I can't put my hand on the book now, but in one of my speeches that I have found and I've put it online when I addressed the class of, of 2013 at St. Hilda's, their graduation class, my auntie found a purple book when I was in second form. It was, oh, I couldn't believe that is exactly how my life has turned out. I wrote in that book in second form that when I grow up, I'd like to be a teacher and why, that was the topic. And, it, and it, I said that I wanted to influence others and I want to teach them about Jamaica, about school, about community and the world. I also said in that book that I wanted to go to university and I started questioning myself, what did a little girl from Glasgow district at that time know about university? I yeah. still can't fathom, yeah. but I said so in the book. I have it written in the, in the book, but I, my, my parents believed in me. They believed in me. 
and they helped to push me, but I was also driven. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I went to Shortwood, as I said, I was a teenager, so much so that most of my students now, I realize that I'm just a few years older than them <laughs> because I went to teach at Brownstone Secondary at the age of 21. Wow. And so most of those big boys, you know, they used to be as, you know, I was a little, very little and tiny and slim. Mm -hmm. And I went to Shortwood and I was saying that I was, I had my head on my body then, you know, because I wanted to do Spanish because it was my favorite subject. And when I went to Shortwood and I realized that they had Spanish and literature, Spanish and science, and they didn't do literature and I didn't do science and Spanish and PE. I said, oh no, my dream is going to be dead. But you know, I never gave up as a 19 year old. I said to myself, what is, I started crying at the interview and they took me one side and they encouraged me. They said, look again at what we have offering. And I said to myself, all right, I'm 19. I'm not going to sit out. I am going to find something and person. Yeah. And I selected upper primary education. Wow. But to tell you how life turned out because I was so outstanding as a Spanish student at St. Hilda's. A vacancy came up just after I left college stood for a Spanish teacher at Brownstone Secondary. And do you know that was where I went? And I was given the job because my high school teacher recommended me. Wow. And I had children walking and talking Spanish and people thought that they um, that I had had all this lots of knowledge and so on about Spanish, but it was my passion, you mm -hmm. know? And that I, when I finished um, St. Hilda's, I, oh, I must remember Mrs. Dorothea Walker. Mm -hmm. She is the bridge. Uh, she became Dr. Dorothea Walker. Uh, she said to me one day, Charmaine, you're a bright girl. You can go to university. I said, no, miss, I can't go to university. I don't have any money and I don't think I can go. She said, are you crazy? Well, you are going to university. She went to the University of the West Indies. Wow. She collected the application forms. She, I, well, I almost <laughs> was under duress. She stood until I completed the forms wow. and I submitted them. I didn't even remember that part of my journey, you know. I must put it in my memoirs. <laughs> and then she sent me off um, to university. Then I got through to university. And that was how I really got to UWE. And, oh. you know, when I went to UWE, I had an experience that has kept me grounded. Mm -hmm. When I went, right in the inter-faculty lecture theater behind me mm -hmm. was one of my students. Because I had taught her at St. Hilda's. I had, at, taught Spanish there part-time as well. Mm -hmm. And she came and she touched me in my back. She said, hi, Miss Wooden. I said, no, no, say Charmaine, say Charmaine, because both of us are at UWI together, okay? There's no miss, I can't call it that. But that taught me a lesson. And it, mm -hmm. I have not forgotten. And every time I go out and I speak to teachers mm -hmm. and to students, I say, be careful of how you nurture these students or what you say to them or do to them, because chances are you are going to meet them again somewhere. Definitely. So treat them with love. And I had teachers who were prejudiced, mm -hmm. some. And I have so many years after, I have still not forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Some students, recently I was online and one student said she was coming to Jamaica. She wanted to know what I wanted because I didn't even know where she was or what she was doing. And when she told me what I did for her at 21 years old, I could not believe. She said her mother had died and they were having a concert and I took my clothes to dress her up. And so on. And he just said to me, we need to have a heart. We need to be empathetic. I don't even remember that. But that is how I treat people generally. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing that I would want people to take away. As educators, we have to be careful how we treat the children. Mm -hmm. Let them feel that they can do it. Mm -hmm. Let them believe in themselves. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Goodmontif, uh, you, speaking of um, being an advocate, because you're a success coach and an advocate and so on, you, you went in to do your doctorate and you did your um, dissertation on a topic which is a special needs kids. And, and eventually you publish the book, Inclusion, the inclusion of um, special need kids in a regular classroom. Um, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, special needs because nowadays you find that uh, they're not, they're barely turning the corner of providing policy for, for inclusion of special need kids in a regular classroom, or even looking at the fact that some of them might have special needs in a regular classroom, and they have not been diagnosed. So they don't get the, um, the, um, the treatment that they need or the, the, the support that they need in the regular classroom or taking them out and making sure that they get support. Um, what basically, you, you did the research, you published, what compelled you to get 
into to go into that area of um, for, for the dissertation and then publishing? What compelled you? Okay, thanks for that question, Dr. Dice. Yeah. Um, globally, there has been a thrust towards inclusion, and I I was stimulated to look in that direction because I've had friends and one or two close family members to me who struggled through the system. And I realized that they, after getting them tested, we realized that they had challenges. And the, most of the times in the regular classroom, the teachers are not able to, um, they don't know what's going on with the children. Usually they think they are rude because usually these children come on the radar in the regular classroom if they are either gifted or if they are exhibiting poor behavior or something is going, or they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, not staying on task and things like those. So I, it piqued my interest and I decided that, you know something, since I'm in education and I'm, I'm preparing for retirement as well, I would like to look at inclusion. So I wanted to find out some more. So I, I had a hard time conducting the research because number one, so the Caribbean, there is very, as I'm, uh, very little literature. Yeah. I only found a monograph in Jamaica that was done in 2005. And I found another article that was done by Black Man et al. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at Trinidad and uh, Tobago. Mm -hmm. But very, very little. I really thank my professor, Dr. Carol Truman, who lives in Canada. Mm -hmm. She was the one who even helped me to find some of the information that about Jamaica, but there was very, very little. So I had to, most of my literature review came from um, other countries, especially the US. Oh. No, one of the things that I learned from the, from not only my research, but from also the study that was done in 2005, mm -hmm. is that in our classroom, as, as you know, the children are all there and we we are we know that 10% of any setting like that has children with um, special needs. But like I said before, they only come on the radar when there are, are issues. Now the whole there are different me different dif definitions of inclusion. <laughs> One of them is that inclusion is not a matter of where you are geographically, but where you feel you belong. Some believe that it's a social issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's also it's, uh, some people believe that it's as a is a response to disciplinary exclusion. Mm -hmm. Some people also believe that it is in relation to um, education for all and um, having different persons coexisting. For example, as you know, in the US under the IDEA, mm -hmm. you have. They have persons in the, in the in the um individual with disabilities um education act okay. where persons they have certain rights um and responsibilities and you know they have to be the, the students have to be catered for so they have to be educated in the least restrictive environment with their non-disabled peers and it, it 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 teaches one of the things I like about the idea of inclusion or the philosophy is that it it teaches um children who are who don't have disabilities to show respect for persons who have disabilities and help to collaborate with them to help them to you know become and to 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 to, to, to coexist in the classroom also teachers when i did my research you know i, I had to when i looked at what ex happened in some other some of the other countries i said to myself the same thing could be said say said about Jamaica and when I interviewed the teachers at the, the target school that I did because I just did one at a primary my research was conducted at a primary school and okay. I just want to tell you the questions that I tried to answer yeah but the the teachers had similar responses to teachers who were questioned elsewhere because teachers have this fear about having oh well first of all the children are already there but if they know that they are they they have challenges they are worried because you know globally teachers are being held more and more responsible and accountable. And if people are looking at the numbers, so some teachers sometimes feel worried that if they don't have the necessary support services, because it doesn't make sense. You say you believe in inclusion and you're not putting the, your money where your mouth is and having the support services and, you know, and assistive technology and all the things that the teachers would need because it's difficult, remember, especially in Jamaica, um, we have very large class sizes. And so the teachers definitely need support. 
and throughout the Caribbean, just recently I spoke at an Honest Conversation series that was put on by um, a group in Barbados, where they were looking at special education and more and more persons are now focusing because in the past, when you said, I remember the years ago, somebody was running for office and the person um, mentioned special education and somebody rebutted and said, all she knows to do a talk about special education, not knowing that it would really mm -hmm. become the buzzword these days because if you don't yeah. understand how the children learn and the things <clears> that are affecting them, um, you know, then you'd have a challenge. They, in Jamaica as well, we, the task force report of 2004, the education task force, they had done a great job of identifying the challenges. Thank God since 2014, mm -hmm. we passed the Disabilities Act and it was officially, I would say, rolled out or implemented Last week on, or the week on, before. On, on February 14th, yeah, yeah, yeah. Valentine's yeah, Day, and it was a good day to tie to so we won't, we won't forget. Mm -hmm. But we have, you know, a lot of at-risk students. So Myris and the Salamanca statement that a lot of us who do research on special education reference yeah. is the, that every child has a fundamental right to education yeah. and must be given the opportunity to achieve and maintain an acceptable level of, of learning. Every child has, a, has unique characteristics, interests, abilities, and learning needs. Now, education systems should be designed and educational programs implemented to take into account um, all of these. Mm -hmm. Now, my research, my research is not the title of my book. What is interesting, when I was doing my research, the title of my book, slightly different, mm -hmm. I, that was what I wanted to be, the title of my research. But my professor oh. said that I should call it something else. But the, 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 the content remains, however. Mm -hmm. So my, the title of my research was The Impact of a Professional Development Program on Jamaican Teach Workshop on Jamaican Teachers' Knowledge, Attitudes, and Practice in Jamaica. How and many, it, hold on, how many um, schools did you include? In I, I, I did it at one primary school. How, how many Central participants? Jamaica. How many participants? I think it was almost 40 or something like that. Okay. Yes. So of course, you know, a study like that, you would have your, like any other study, you would have your limitations. Yeah, hold, I, I want to show a clip here with you. Okay. It's, a, it's the book um, a, a feature. Okay, when I have a book launch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let, I want um the audience to take a look at this. It's it's pretty good, and you get some people reflecting on the idea of the the, the book itself. So, um, listen to this. Inspiring that Dr. Monteith would uh, spend the time to focus a lot on special education. It is a group of students that we have within our education system that are under, usually underrepresented. And so um, it's wonderful that somebody would take the work that they've done in the doctoral thesis and actually apply it um, to a book. You know, and I think it makes fantastic reading also, and it is very instructive. I actually recommend that our principals uh, actually get a copy. In fact, at Monroe College, we have acquired a few copies that will serve to assist our staff in enlightening them on the importance of uh, catering to special needs in schools. It, it makes for fantastic reading, uh, particularly because oftentimes we think about special needs only on the most critical part of the spectrum. But there are many, many mild occurrences of special needs that occur among children. Uh, and um, it's very important that we provide them with the type of support and knowledge that will help them to identify when this occurs and seek the appropriate um, support. You know, what, what we have found you know, is that um, we do have across the education um, sector children with varying degrees of special needs um, well i would be able to speak you know, off the cuff about monroe college but what i do know is that you have cases where kids have autism for example very mild autism and uh, one made us think the child is antisocial when indeed the child is actually uh, suffering from uh, you know autism and this book i think provides that knowledge that um, data you know driven research that will provide the basis from which to assist and support students with various types of disorders. This book is, is critical at this time. There is not much material that is written from a Caribbean perspective and even further a Jamaican perspective. And so what we have seen in this book is the history of special education, where we are coming from and what it has done as well is it has, it has emphasized the struggles we've had over the years and where we are now. What the book does is it projects where we can go to because it emphasizes that the case study that was done by Dr. Monteith emphasizes that with, with training, with training and professional development, teachers are able to understand the needs of children with special needs in the classroom and this will make inclusion worthwhile. This will make inclusion work. It's very important that 
we demystify students with special needs. It's very important that we understand that students with special needs are just persons who may learn a little differently, and it's a matter of, of understanding them and accommodating them in the classroom. And so this book speaks to training teachers and helping them to be ready for the inclusive classroom, which is, a, which is where we're going in the future of education in Jamaica. One of the things. All right, so we can stop right there. But the, these two stalwarts, the, the principals and special education um, personnel, they actually reflected, they, they gave quite uh, um, a deep um, set of values that this book brought out for special needs students. Yes. And we need to pay attention to them. Yes, um, yes. How is the reaction across Jamaica, the wider Jamaica? To the, my book? Yeah, yeah, to the, the content. Yes. Oh, yeah. Very positive. In fact, I when I spoke at the Success Summit, I went and that summit um, was, I took part in that summit because of my one of my past students who lives in the Bahamas. Yeah. He invited me as a, uh, his teacher. It was another crowning moment when they said what I did for them, which I didn't remember. However, when I spoke at that conference, a principal called me after and she said, um, I didn't know that you had a book by that title because she had just completed a training session at, that was put on by the Ministry of Education. And she said how she was searching for resources and she didn't yeah. know about the book. I also a principal of another school, a very large um, high school. She bought some copies and she told me how she they set up a learning community in their school and they went through the book and they took look at what happened in different countries because I really covered quite a number of countries in my literature review. And they looked at that and they looked at some of the suggestions. Um, the fact that co-teaching is very important. We don't practice that a lot in Jamaica where you have both a special ed teacher and a regular classroom teacher yeah. collaborating yeah. and you know the different things that they could do to ensure that to, to, to help the teacher because a large part of the success of any inclusion program is going to be the teacher's self-efficacy. The teacher has to believe that he or she can do it because you know once you start doubting yourself, that's a problem. And Bandura talks about that because that was the theory that I looked at when I did my research. Yep. And yep. and you need the, the person. So the, the and the teachers said so when they did the the, um, the questionnaires. They said that. Honestly, they didn't know much about the special education or special needs or anything like that. And so after they did it, they, 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 I did the workshop with them. They, some of them felt that, I think I wrote the comments down here. Some of them felt that they would want to continue. Mm -hmm. This was what some of them said, um, to learn some more about special education. Some also said, of course, you know, you, couldn't, you wouldn't have the changes overnight just like that. So, so there, this, the results of the study show that a professional development workshop can positively influence teachers' knowledge, attitudes, and practice regarding inclusion. It is a positive beginning that shows promise of the development of an inclusive community at the target school if professional learning and addressing teachers' concerns can become universally accepted priorities. Mm -hmm. Now, the, that was what I said in my conclusion, but, the, but so one of the the teacher said that an inclusive classroom might be beneficial to some students, but this is a direct quote. I am, however, of the firm belief that teachers should be adequately trained for this kind of classroom mm -hmm. and should also be adequately um, should, and should also be given support to meet the different needs. That's what was what, what one teacher said. Yeah. One teacher also said that because of the exposure, she believes that she would be able to manage that kind of setting if she um, she received the support. But some another teacher said that even with the training, she did not believe that they, the children should be in the classroom. They should be segregated, a segregated setting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, but, 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 the, but the world yeah. over, because as I said, yeah. Barbados, I listened to people from Tobago the other night on yeah. the honest so, conversation. So Dr. Dr. Barker, you know, we you you're big on research, especially in Jamaica and the Caribbean. And we talk about this a lot. This is not my initiative. This is your your thinking, your brainchild here, so to speak. And we had quite a bit of conversations about research in Jamaica. And yeah, what Dr. Yeah. Good Monty here is doing is actually setting up the platform. Well, she's adding. She's yeah. adding to the to the research oh, here. Yeah. I, th I suppose I think what you're talking about certainly is something that we could always look and say, perhaps that's a failing of our educational system because it, our, even our preparation of teachers, I, I would hope that you'd agree that it doesn't prepare us for an inclusive um, classroom environment. 
if anything, it assumes that it's a separate functioning. But my question to you, given that you have published the book and it's clear that the book has had you know, a positive um, response from the different people that has come around the book. And it's certain that this book is bringing some of the topics that maybe would be taboo in the past. I suppose my question to you, now that the book is out, now that people know of the book, now that you know, we're seeing, based on what you're saying, the connection between efficacy and effectiveness, mm -hmm. you know, my question is what next? Now that the book is out, what next, given your connections and so on, what's, what's I, next? I, what I would like to do, and um, is to help the school, to take it to another level. Just last week, I was invited by a school to come and do a workshop for them, um, using the book as a source text and to help them. Yeah. So to, to put it more there, but you know, COVID came, but that's no excuse because it provides an opportunity because I had the books and the, the feedback was good and they were going out there, but I have I had to pause because of COVID because schools were closed and so on. Yeah. I yeah. tried uploading one on, there's one on Amazon, but it's sitting there. Mm -hmm. So I need to do something about that. But I believe we need to, to, to have more of these conversations and to help teachers in the different areas um, mm -hmm. to, to ensure that they feel comfortable because, you know, once they feel comfortable, once a teacher is comfortable and you are educators, you know, in doing that topic, Mm -hmm. then you, you know you're good to go yeah. so they have to we have to try to ensure that teachers have the confidence and mm -hmm. we help to be, help them to build the ministry of yeah. education though is doing a good job in trying to um support the teachers we also at the jta we have had our we have our professional mm -hmm. development and there is a special mm -hmm. education committee as well mm -hmm. and so and so the caribbean mm -hmm. as as I said, I just spoke about the Honest Conversation series where persons are now, it's not having any taboo anymore. Persons yeah. realize that, you know, teachers need the support yeah. and teachers need to have the support and to understand and to change the mindset. Parent to one of the things that I did, which was, I tell you, that was an experience. It was, it was such an experience. It was like catharsis. Everybody was just crying. Yeah. I had a workshop for the parents of children with special needs. And in that audience, we had about um, six teachers and they wept openly about how they suffered and the, how their children suffered and that parents, how they were treated even though they were teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a real challenge because the children really struggle and some of them didn't understand the problems. So we had presenters talking to them, telling them where they could find help. Both the and it was, I had never, I mean, been to anything like that where it was just so they had so much pent-up emotions mm -hmm. because you know already it's a challenge when your child isn't doing well and you know one of the things I always say to people and when I do when I used to love to do professional development workshops with young teachers and I used to say to them even before I had started doing special ed I would say to them listen when you are when, when you have the children in front of you one of the things that you must do is to show them love Mm -hmm. Children learn from the teachers who they love. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. I can use my son as an example. Mm -hmm. Please treat them with love and respect. Mm -hmm. And they will learn from you. Yeah. They will even they try. Because one of the things in our jurisdiction, I find that some persons sometimes, you know a child is giving trouble and a parent comes to see you and immediately you start with the negatives. And I've always said, especially in this book that I didn't talk much about, the winning PR, that when, yeah, you, when a parent comes to speak, see you, you should start with something positive. The child must be doing something right. Yeah, if yeah. that is sweeping the class or something. Yeah. So when a parent comes in, say the, the positives first. Yeah. And in this book, Winning PR and Communication Strategies, I have shown... And I remember taking this book to England with me when I went to, um, as an education officer, when we were twinning schools with schools in um, Region 5 with schools in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I yeah, said, that's my, I, my city, that's in a... Really? Yeah, that's, that's a Barker city. You're in England? Ah, well, technically, my, I lived in Birmingham for about 10 years. So. My brother lives here in Hansworth. He oh, went away yeah. the same year. I know Hansworth. I know Hansworth very well. I know. I you went know, to the um, Foster Allen used to be a head teacher oh, in um, Hansworth. He, Oh, really? I think my good friend, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yes. But, uh, so I like in this book, what it does, the winning PR, yeah. I am the person, I wrote the media relations module for National College for Educational Leadership. And I'm also a presenter. I've also been to the British Virgin Islands to present for them. Mm -hmm. And I present in the public speaking module. My book here looks at PR 
And can you hold it up, hold it up to the screen? PR for schools is very important because yeah. you have a lot of schools that are doing very well and they don't know how to tell their stories. So this yeah. book does, teaches you how to write newsletters, mm -hmm. how to write a speech, how to write a greeting, mm -hmm. how to con communicate with your various stakeholders, mm -hmm. how to manage your PR, events planning. Mm -hmm. And it also speaks to have a, a talk, I have a thing that is called a child's dream. And this was, this was written in 2010. It says, my teachers, this was before I did special ed. My teachers know my name. I love my class teacher because she does not shout at me. Teacher, you tell me positive words and punish me with love. You treat us equally. You teach well as you give us activities and you make the lessons very interesting and interactive. You pause at intervals to ensure that we understand what you're teaching. When I do not understand what you teach, I can come to you after class to get your help. You never compare me with others. You never tell me that I'm worthless. You always encourage me. Sometimes when I sit at the back of the class or if I do not pay attention, you are so alert and you get me to participate again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to a new class next term and I'm worried because I'm not sure what my new teacher will be like. Sometimes I feel so sad because I do not think some of my teachers really understand me. When I give trouble sometimes, it might be because I have learning difficulties maybe ADHD, maybe my attention span is just short. I might be having problems at home. It could be that I did not have any breakfast. So teacher, you will understand how disappointed I am when I'm unable to perform very well so that my name can go on the honors chart. I want to do very well like the other students, but you will have to spend some more time with me. Please tell your colleagues to look out for students like me. Please let them understand me. You know, I read that at a, uh, I gave a speech uh, once and I read it and somebody asked me who wrote that? Where can I get that book to buy? And I autographed it and gave it to the gentleman. Wow, well, wow. Well. But that's um, very nice. Let me ask you something though, because yeah. I think you have touched on an issue that, and I think your first book is the one that really why I want to stay centered on a little bit because yeah. you touch on an area that I believe that, as you say, it's coming on stream. It's becoming more the, the, the buzzword. It's the thing that everyone, and one of the person who was talking about your book said it's coming. It's already here and maybe has been in many countries for maybe 20, 25 years. But my question is, given that you're in the landscape of Jamaica, you've already published a book in that space. We have seen the Disability Act come into being February 14th, as I said. What I'm asking about is the future of special education you know, in Jamaica. Do you see enough movements for this to be you know, integrated into what a teacher in Jamaica looks like? And, and do you feel like the resources are being put in place? And, you know, and then the other question I'd like, and a lot of what you mentioned, JTA and the Ministry of Education, do you see an opportunity within the Jamaican landscape, like in many other countries in the world, for other providers who have the expertise to come in and do this, like mm -hmm. even with experts like yourself, rather than going on that um, long train of the government or the JTA to do this? Yes, sure, there is an opportunity for persons to come in and collaborate. And um, yes, we are making strides, to be honest, because some of the things, for example, a child find was done um, by the Ministry of Education. Some of that information um, is available. I've used some of it in my research. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Floyd Morris, who is yeah. at the University of the West Indies Center for Disability, Floyd, Floyd, yeah. he's doing a great job. He just published a refereed um, journal, and my article is on it as well. On, on special education. He mm -hmm. had a, a conference on um, disabilities, um, international conference. I was one of the presenters. He had several persons from throughout the Caribbean. I, I feel encouraged too, because I met a lady who did one on teacher's knowledge, attitude and practice, but she looked at different variables. She's in Trinidad. My, the, my colleague who was the head of special ed at the ministry, um, the deputy at, at, the, at the ministry, assistant um, education officer, she and I studied together at NOVA. Mm -hmm. um, Southeastern University. She also has a research that she had looked at the tertiary sector. So several of us have graduated since 27 and others continue to do it. And it is also in the college um, mm -hmm. program for the teachers who are being trained. So they are, they are, they are, they are more aware. Because mm -hmm. I remember even when I used to do the new teachers seminars and I would, even before I had studied special ed and I would raise it, some of them had an understanding of what to look for. So there is opportunity. And, but there, I think we still need to find some more resources Mm -hmm. I believe what needs to happen in Jamaica, just like in the US, where you had Brown versus the Board of Education, mm -hmm. uh, where you had more per parents advocating for their children. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you look at so many, I was enthralled. I, I was so happy that I decided to do um, the US law 
um, special education law and special education. So I learned a lot and I really saw the parents' journey where they had to fight hard. Even in the US where they have the support services and they have the Individual with yeah, Disabilities Education Act and so on. So, but I think Jamaica, we are getting there, but you know, culturally, stigma. because generally stigma, stigma yeah. Remember, yeah. say you feel, say, once you- It's a stigma. Everybody yeah, must write, and if you don't write, you don't. Do but you know what I found interesting? I don't remember which country, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. But in my research, I found one of the countries, I couldn't believe, I said, I thought we were the only ones who thought that way, where they said that um in the country, that some the parents must have done something wrong mm -hmm. while the children come out like that. So well, well that. I mean, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, if you get in the Eastern part of the world, there's a lot of those kind of perceptions. In mm -hmm. fact, um, there's resistance for children to be even identified as having mm -hmm. any form of um, yes. um, special educational needs because it is a, a stigma on the families and, and, and maybe even represents karma in some ways. So yes, there's yes, a lot yes. of pieces that, that are in that. You know, I suppose we are bringing our um, some customs, but certainly in Jamaica, there's a stigma attached yes. to not being right. I remember the district that I grew up in, my neighbor's daughter, that time we don't know nothing about no special education and i remember the child never went to school and she never go to school at all and i remembered they used to say she had echolalia, um, echolalia and i thought it was because whatever she was saying she was echoing the things and so on and, okay and you call her and says um if you said like you say like you said sharon and she would say sharon and everything i said uh. it was later and i realized it yeah, um it was um autism you know, oh. we, we, we learn the different, you know, things. But I'm saying, too, one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping that I will see happen in my lifetime yeah. is when parents spend the money, because it's very expensive. Well, no, they have put um, diagnostic centers right across um, the island. Some of them are operational, some are not. I'm not even too sure what is the update, but on that. However, one of the things I've found, that, uh, having worked closely with or had somebody close to me and, and family, or family and friends, is that sometimes the parents waste the money. Well, I wouldn't say waste it. You go and you do the psychoeducational assessment. Mm -hmm. The report states exactly what is to, it details what is to happen when yes. you go to school. And half of the times when the parent takes that thing, that thing goes in 513, nothing happens. And you will see a report which says the child is either talking too much, not. And if you say, and I'm saying that if every teacher is saying the same thing in the class, it must raise a red flag that something is going on with this child. So what about the thing that the parent went and did? The parents also need to understand, and the teacher, well, one thing I'm happy for, and I always say to teachers, remember, know that you cannot afford to diagnose because you're not in a position to, you have to send the person to the experts to do the the, um, the, the, the the testing and the diagnosis. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying, I think more support is needed though when the children, parents do these expensive tests mm -hmm. and they go back, they need, because for example, a simple one like the child writes slowly. And so, you know, you know how we stay from long time. You write on the board and as the one, they will write fast, write off, you erase yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, Some of the children have genuine problems, not because they are lazy or slow. You know, you just have to, so you have to work with them and provide the support. Because once children are given the support, um, they will more or less function to their, yeah. you know, ability, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so. Yeah. so um, before we, we wind down here, um, we really appreciate you coming on, Dr. Charmaine Goodmont. Very, it's very enlightening and uh, I'm, I'm sure the ideas that Dr. Baca and I spoke about with research in Jamaica and the Caribbean, you're, you're really stroking that area of us to, to get up off our rumps and, and get something done in that area too, to contribute just like what you're doing in Jamaica and to get other people involved, especially with um, special needs. Um, yes. For Edutag, um, everyone, we are looking at um, the book that Dr. Good uh, Monteith wrote, Inclusion of students with special needs in the regular classroom. And she also wrote the communication one. Remind us of the title. Winning PR and communication strategies, toolkits yes. for educators. Um, Doc, I just yes. wanted to highlight one thing because sometimes some persons believe that we have to have negative things for, for persons to, to like ne negative messages. So for example, I came up with these things to say that when you're putting up like signs in your school, Mm -hmm. You can put up positive signs. Um, for example, instead of saying we you shouldn't come here dressed a certain way, you tell them how to dress. You should say uh, <laughs> we value our parents and mm -hmm. encourage them to lead by example through speech, dress, and the deportment on and off the compound. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that I came up with. You know, we are proud to be Jamaicans. And one um, you teacher, need to, 
Yeah, you need to organize some workshops around yes. this this topic because I mean, I'm not very well needed. Up, but I'm going to rely on you people sometimes yeah. because I'm in a position of influence. I'm shy to put my work out there. No. So I understand. I, I, I think I've been listening to you. Yeah. I realize that you're in one of those positions that yeah. um, while you have a book out there, there are certain there will be a few um, conflicts in terms of how do you promote what you know needs to be done without seeming as if you're taking a different direction or yeah. or even trying to claim the direction that yeah. maybe organizations that some you're working with and some you're working in partnership mm -hmm. with. But I, I believe that the mission is still a very big mission and it's big enough for everyone to do it. It's big mm -hmm. enough for everyone to do it. Mm -hmm. Because can I ask a very simple question then? For example, when students take, for example, c now that's our big exam, everybody does it, right? Or even PEP, where we claim to have nearly 100% um, enrollment. At CSEC, we don't really have that. Are students given accommodations, for example, if they have learning difficulty, are they able to get um, a 25% more time or 50% more time base? Are these part of the education system? Or just, just clarify, are, do you know? If you don't have to know, I'm just asking. Yeah, I have an idea, but um, I don't want to have all the details, but I do know that it exists. But however, you know how these things go. The persons who are in a better position to know, they know and they, their children benefit. There are others who just because I said that sometimes when you get the reports, they're not even treated seriously. Then they, 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 they sometimes they, the parents give it and they, didn't, they, they don't even send it off to CSC to say, but I have known like, of like my neighbor's son and I've known of other children, but I've also known of persons who have taken in the reports. They thought it was sent in, the child was not given the accommodation. So the child was not, did, well, they didn't get a chance to complete the exam, but you have to, once they- These they, are the practical- the, 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 psychological, the educational psychologist says the yeah. child needs to be accommodated. The ministry tries to do it, but I believe more children should be given the opportunity because many of them have challenges. Some of them write slowly. So if they have a writer, and they can't yeah, I mean, we insist, yeah. you know, there are many things, stories I could share, but I'll share with you outside of this forum. But yeah. you know, but, but what it, it, it does exist, but some of the parents need to know, some of the teachers need to know, and they need to know how to go about it. Yeah. Uh, there are I didn't get a chance, I hope I'll get a chance to mention my son. I have one child, my family before I go, and at least two awards that I've gotten that I didn't mention. Yeah, yeah. Would, would mention. Do it now, profile. do it now, do it yes. now. Well, I'd like to mention my son i have a son by the name of chad it's only one son i have it means the world to me mm -hmm. i'm married yeah. i have three brothers oh. and a sister yeah and um what about the awards uh, the awards um yeah. i received the prime minister's medal of appreciation for um, outstanding contribution to education in jamaica mm -hmm. and i had received the jta golden torch award wow. for 35 years in the sector wow. And um, I had mentioned before that I had gone on to the, on the Canadian Teachers Federation yeah. um, Fellowship. So, so it's very good, yeah. Yes, yes. So thank you so much um, on behalf of all of us here at End of Talk. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us. Um, we're going to see you again um, in the near future. Um, thank you so much, yeah, Dr. For, and Dr. Yeah. Barker. Yeah, yeah. To, to feature you in Women's History Month is really a pleasure. It's really a, a I feel humbled and, and honored. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of but the other thing, Dice, before yeah. you jump off, is that yeah. in Where's just the, listening the, to her story, yes, and there was one man, I know she mentioned her father who is a shopkeeper, but yeah. throughout that entire journey, it's just a lot of women, a lot of yeah. heroes that seem to be popping up along her storyline to get her where she is, yeah. And, yeah. and and I think as we celebrate, um, women's history, know, women's month, mm -hmm. what well, we are realizing that women doing these great things don't do them only for a month. They are doing it all the time, you know. Yes. And, and you know, um, I forgot the doctor mentioned the names of the women. Can oh, I? Oh yeah, yeah. Some names, man. Dorothea and. Oh, but those were the <laughs> were the names that I had, but they came up based on the questions. My oh, mother, okay. Ivadne Gooden. My yeah, okay. um, Dr. Merrick Henry at UWE, who was my mentor. Um, Mrs. Rosemary Vernon, past president of the Jamaica Teachers Association, and um, my aunt Lilith, Miss Broomfield from Glasgow. Wow. And those were my, my heroes. Your heroes. And, oh, no, but still are my heroes heroes. and they are we are <laughs> responsible for yes. where I am today. Of course. And this rose yes, and my grandma who had our basic school. Yes, it's women's on. month. So just big up all the women who are doing some amazing big things, up. you know, without we call them unsung heroes, you know. Yes. And and the reality of it is that because society has given them this idea that they are supposed to be nurturing.
people don't notice what they're doing because it is considered to be what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. and sometimes, you know, they say sometimes people don't know how much driving you're doing until when you park. <laughs> That's true. Or when it's you're just when they stop as a bit tired, we realize how much work they are doing. So it's true. I want to help you celebrate all of these women who have been yeah. such a yes. and as advisor to the JTA's women's caucus, thank you. Yes. And we yes. will be putting on some women's um events as well. Yeah, yeah, we need them. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of um women, uh, we're going to feature for this um edit talk show, we're featuring um Sarah J. Garnett. And Sarah J. Garnett was the is the first uh, black female public school principal in New York City. She's the, she's the first. And so I want, we want everyone to take a look and take a listen to her video at this time. We're featuring Sarah J. Garnett for Women's History Month. Sarah Smith Tompkins Garnett was born in 1831 in Brooklyn, New York, to free parents Anne and Sylvana Smith, founders of the Free Black Community in Weeksville. She was a suffragette, civil rights activist, businesswoman, and the first African-American female principal in New York City public schools. She was the second wife of Reverend Dr. Henry Highland Garnett. She was the oldest of 11 children. Her parents were farmers and among the founders of the African-American community of Weeksville in Brooklyn, then part of Long Island. Her sister, Susan McKinney Stewart, was the first African-American woman in New York State to earn a medical degree and the third in the United States. In the late 1880s, Sarah Garnett helped found the Equal Suffrage League, a Brooklyn-based club for Black women. The League insisted that women had the same human, intellectual, and spiritual capabilities as men, and that the denial of women's rights to vote in a nation that was founded on the ideal, on the people's right to rule, was unjust. In the early 1900s, after Garnett became the superintendent of the Suffrage Department of the National Association of Colored Women, NACW, the Equal Suffrage League would become affiliated with National Association of Colored Women. Garnett, along with the president of the League, Dr. Vienna Harris Morton Jones, supported the creation of the Niagara Movement, which demanded equal rights for all Americans. Her life was dedicated to teaching, not only in the classroom, but also in her community. When Sarah Garnett began teaching in New York City, the public schools were racially segregated. In 1845, at the age of 14, Garnett started working as a teacher's assistant. Nine years later, in 1854, she became a teacher at the African Free School of Williamsburg, which is now part of Brooklyn. Garnett adopted new pedagogical methods throughout her teaching career. All her hard work was recognized on April 30th, 1863, when she was appointed a principal in the New York public school system. She would oversee two public schools, grammar school number four and public school number 80, until she retired in 1900. She served as teacher and principal for 37 years. Throughout her career in the education system, Garnet fought to abolish race discrimination for all colored teachers, for equal pay, for equal work performed by women, and women's rights. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, Dr. Barker, my esteemed uh, co-host here at Edu Talk, thank you for being with me this week and sharing the space. Uh, much appreciated, and Dr. Good Montif, thank you, our special guest this week. We truly enjoy the time, and we will see you again. All right. Thank you so much for having me, though. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Both of you. Yes. Yeah. No, no, Both it's an amazing having yeah. you here. Having you then. All right. Really Take care, everybody. As we usually say, um, walk good, and we will feature another um special person um next week on Edit Talk. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.